open uh, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7 and uh, verses 11 through 17. And uh, really, we come to, I think, a, a wonderful story of Jesus raising a man from the dead. And here we just see a, an amazing sense of, of Jesus' power. In fact, Jesus' power over death. Now, without question, I think we, should, we would all agree that Jesus Christ is the most well-known person in human history. The literate civilizations of the world all know something about Jesus Christ. The exceptions, of course, around the world will be those tribes and isolated groups who haven't heard the gospel as yet. It is rare to find someone who hasn't heard about the Lord Jesus Christ in our media-dominated world today. But as universal as the knowledge of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ might be, knowing who he is is not so universal. There are diverse and different opinions concerning who Jesus Christ really is. And what, are, what is essential is to know the truth. And the truth, simply put, is that Jesus Christ is God, fully man and fully God. And that is the core, the heart, the foundation of the Christian faith. That is also the testimony of Scripture. Uh, Jesus explains God. Jesus reveals God. So when you look at Jesus, you are seeing God. That's why Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus has made God known. He is God in human flesh. And that is why Luke calls him the son of the most high God. He calls him the holy offspring way back in the first chapter of Luke. And as Luke unfolds the history of Jesus Christ, he continually demonstrates that Jesus is God, fully man and fully God. And he demonstrates that there is no other explanation for Jesus Christ than that he is God. There are, are no other possible explanations. Now we have seen that all the way through this incredible gospel, haven't we, so far? The original angelic revelation that the child will be born indicated that he will be coming down from heaven, that he would be Emmanuel, God with us. The angels proclaimed that to Joseph, to Mary, to Zechariah, to Elizabeth. They proclaimed it to the shepherds. The virgin birth indicated that he was God. His parents affirmed it. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they too affirmed it. So did Anna and Simeon. And even more importantly, God the Father affirmed it at his baptism. And so did the Holy Spirit. And then, when Jesus began his ministry, he showed power over Satan in triumphing over temptation. And then he showed power over the demons in casting the demons out. In fact, one of the demons said in Luke 4, verse 34, he said, I know who you are. Notice, you are the Holy One of God. And then in his power to heal diseases, it was clear that he was God, because every time he healed somebody, he literally recreated them physically. His teaching also showed his deity because he taught as one, as, as no one had ever had taught with knowledge and wisdom without equal. Now all of that, Luke wants us to understand, if you like, Luke is building his case. He is building his case that Jesus is God and now he comes to Jesus' power over life and death. And Jesus' deity is evident because amazingly he raises a dead man from the dead. And as the story unfolds, we're going to see time and time again the evidence is that Jesus is God. So follow with me on your outline. And the first thing I want you to see here is the divine purpose of Jesus. The divine purpose of Jesus. And we see that here in verse 11. We read verse 11, soon afterwards. Now that would be soon after recorded in this prior passage, remember. You remember that he healed the slave of the centurion? We had a wonderful time studying that passage last week. Soon afterwards, that would indicate a few days at most, Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. Now, question, why did he do that? Why did he decide to go to Nain? Nain is about 20 miles from Capernaum. It would be a full day's walk to walk the 20 miles. It was a small, very nondescript and insignificant town. And Jesus decides to go to Nain and drag this huge entourage with him for this day's journey. 
Now, when you look at Jesus, you're looking to see God, and you see here an attribute of God, and that is divine purpose. God never acts without a fixed goal and a fixed purpose. God never acts impulsively. There are no unexpected coincidences. You know, there is no plan Bs with God. Everything within the plan of God is fixed, settled, unchanging, and brought to pass. He is sovereign. He has perfect intentions for everything he thinks, everything he says, and every act. His mission is clear. His objective is clear. His strategy is clear. His plan, his purpose will come to pass. Now, we see that time and time again in the Old Testament. It makes it very clear that that is how God acts. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. We love this verse, don't we? God said, for I know the plans I have for you. In other words, there are no random thoughts in God's mind. Nothing sort of pops into God's mind. He he doesn't have to remember anything, nor does he forget anything. Everything is purposeful, planned, fixed, unchangeable, and settled. He also says in Isaiah 55, verse 11, My word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Every thought is intentional. Every word is intentional. Every thought affects its end. Every word affects its goal. And also in Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 11, God says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. So every thought God has, every word God says, every act God does, he operates perfectly on a divinely established purpose. And that is the way it is with Jesus. I mean, if you study the life of Jesus in the Gospels, you will find a certain resolve in Jesus, such as in John 4, verse 4, when he says, I have to go through Samaria. Why do you have to go through Samaria, Jesus? Because the plan is that there is a well there, and when you get to that well, there will be a woman there too, and at that very moment he will get there, he will have this encounter with this woman that has been planned from eternity past by God. It wasn't just a coincidence that he happened to be there at that point. It was planned. Or Luke 9, verse 51, as the time approached for him, that is Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He knew exactly when he was going to die, when he was going to rise again, when he was going to ascend into heaven. He knew exactly the timetable and what the steps were to bring that to pass. And so he resolutely sets out to Jerusalem. Now, this is evidence of his deity. He knows the future. He knows the divine purpose. He works on a timetable. Now here, in Luke 7, we see Jesus demonstrating the very nature of God. He knows where he's going, he knows what's going to happen when he gets to Nain, even though the people that he will meet there don't know it. He knew when he got there, everything would be the way that he wanted it. In fact, verse 11 tells us that he wasn't alone, do you see that? His disciples were going going to go along with him, and this group, by the way, this would include his apostles, those who are his true followers, his disciples, but it also includes anybody else who was a student, someone who was was a a learner. You know, disciples were described that, and they were students, basically. Now, this was his entourage. He was a teacher of teachers and, and a mentor, and he had this massive crowd of hundreds, if not thousands of people, following him everywhere he went. And they were learning, and they were all different levels of learning and commitment to Jesus. Now, in addition to the disciples, there was a large crowd. Now, they weren't committed to him in that sense. They weren't committed students of his. This was just, if you like, the the thrill seekers. These were the people who were curious about Jesus' ministry, the people who were following, because they they were so amazed at what he said and, and what he did. You know, power over demons, power over disease. And this crowd don't have any clue what he's going to name. 
Notice he doesn't tell them, does he? I mean, you just imagine, he just, we're going to Nain, and off they go. Doesn't tell them why. And they don't have any sense of divine purpose. I mean, they, like us, can't tell the future. They can barely interpret the present, and we have a hard time interpreting even the past, don't we? But Jesus knows the past, present, and future perfectly. He knows exactly where he's going and why he's going there. So here is Jesus, with intentionality, moving in the direction towards this obscure town that would never be known to us biblically if it weren't for this one incident. But he goes there because it is purposeful in the plan of God if it weren't for this, this, for this encounter with this, notice, this funeral procession. That is God's plan. And the interesting reality about this is this. It would be that when Jesus left that morning to travel to Nain, that man would most likely not have been dead at that point. Because the Jews, you see, never kept a body overnight. Never. It wasn't their custom. They didn't embalm. And we know in, in, a, in a warm country, decay sets in immediately. All they did was that when someone had died, they would sprinkle the body, they would anoint the body externally, they would wrap the body in cloth. Once death occurred, they did that very rapidly, and they had a funeral very rapidly, immediately in effect. And they moved to bury the body. No one was kept overnight. So it's highly possible, very possible, that Jesus started moving towards that funeral procession before there even was a dead person. Now stop and think about that for a moment. If you ever doubt that Jesus knows or God knows what is happening in the future, you've got a fine example here, haven't you? He knew. It was all of his own knowledge. But secondly, divine purpose then melts into the divine providence of Jesus. That's the second thing I want you to notice. Divine purpose melts into the divine providence of Jesus. God not only has a purpose, but God can orchestrate all of the contingencies to bring about that purpose. Now, this is incredible when you stop and think about it. Jesus was going to Nain to raise a dead man. A dead man who may not have been dead when Jesus started his journey to Nain. How was Jesus going to control all of the issues? The death of the man, the timing of the funeral, the service, the whole thing to have this encounter that he wanted to have at the moment that he wanted to have it. Right place, right moment. Well, that is divine providence. And that's a, that's a great word, providence, isn't it? Let me give you a definition. We'll pop it up on the screen. You might want to jot this down. It's a little complicated, so I'll say it a couple of times. But here is my definition of providence. Providence refers to God's superintending control over all human actions and events to affect his predetermined purpose. Discuss. No, okay, I'm not going to do that. But that's the definition of providence. I'll give it to you again. Providence refers to God's superintending control over all human actions and events to affect his predetermined purpose. Now, that is one of the most amazing characteristics of God. See, I don't know about you, but I can understand a miracle better than I can understand providence. Uh, a miracle is not complex in one sense. A miracle is when God steps in interrupts the natural and injects a supernatural explosion of power. I understand that. The natural stops when God steps in supernaturally. But providence isn't that. Providence is God taking all the natural events and orchestrating them perfectly to affect his purpose. And the complexity of that is staggering. Don't miss this. God's providence is absolutely staggering, but he knows all the details. Uh, let me show you, because we're going to name, and here is providence, here is perfect timing. Look at verse 12. As he approached the town gate, now, a small town like this wouldn't have a wall because there wouldn't be anything to protect. Nobody's going to come in and attack Nain. It's a, a small little town, but they had a gate because a gate symbolized that they were a town. 
Uh, and the gate would be at the head of sort of the main street, as it were, and it was a place where they socialised, and it's where the, the elders of the, sort of the town, they sat, uh, and they sort of judged or adjudicated in any issues or any matters that needed to be dealt with. So it, it, had, it had a gate. It was a, it was a symbolic gate in many ways, just sort of identifying it as a town. And so in perfect time, and Jesus approaches the gate of that town, nobody knows why he's going there, remember, yet he does, it's all planned, and we read a dead person was being carried out. Exact split second. <coughs> Providential timing. All the control factors belong to God. The man dies at the right moment. They're getting ready for the funeral at the right moment. They have the funeral. Uh, they go through the wailing. They, they go find at least two flute players. I don't know if you understand this, but no self-respecting Jew would have a funeral without two flute players players, um, even the poorest of the poor, to play mournful notes on the flute. I'm not suggesting that the flute is a mournful, mournful instrument. Good job we've not got our flutists with us today, but they would have people who would do that. And then they would have, as you can imagine, that the flute sort of playing this mournful notes, they would then have a, a guy who would be banging a cymbal at the same time. And that would put some sort of conflict into it to to represent the discord and the pain of loss. And you'd also have at least one wailing woman that was a profession those days. You could be a professional wailing woman at that time. You could make a, you know, um, let's be honest, if, um, if uh, I'm going to do it, but, uh, you know, there, there are women, if they, you know, if we had that today, they would be some women who would qualify that without question, really, wouldn't they, to be fair? But... Uh, you can make a real career out of that. And so you can imagine, can't you? Here we have then these, these, these wailing women uh, and the flute players uh, and the cymbal players and it would be this, create this sort of discord and, and noise and, uh, and move the crowd who would also be wailing and crying and the friends and the family and whoever was in the town. They'd all come out in this entourage of noise, of, of grief, of mourning. Well, it's a startling thing, isn't it, if you picture it? And from a human viewpoint, this is a surprising event. From, G from the viewpoint of Jesus, this is exactly on schedule. See, from the human side, it's just a startling coincidence. There's no such thing as coincidences in God's perspective. The Lord is just gracefully, purposefully taking a step at a time, arriving at the exact moment when that procession came out of town. And biblical history is filled with that kind of scheduling. So out comes this wailing, noisy crowd, and this dead man was being carried out. It says, verse 12, the funeral was over. The people were carrying the corpse that they had sprinkled on the outside, dusted with some powder and some herbs and things like that. Uh, and they then would have wrapped and laid that him out on a flat stretcher. Uh, you notice there in verse 14, the word coffin appears in verse 14. Um, that would be unusual for Jews to put a body in a coffin. They put them on a stretcher normally. And, and actually later on, when the young man sits up, it's pretty evident that he wasn't in a coffin, isn't it, really? So it, it most likely was a stretcher. And, and as I said, the body was always buried immediately, never kept overnight. So most likely the end of the day now, it would take a full day for Jesus to walk those 20 miles, uh, starting early in the morning. The man could have died in the afternoon or late morning and already has, uh, died already before Jesus had started out. And Jesus gets there before the death has even occurred for this divine rendezvous. Now, interestingly, burial places were always outside of town. You might be wondering why they were leaving the town. They were always outside of town. Poor people might... And perhaps like this widow, she, she may have been poor. Uh, we don't necessarily know that she was poor. I mean, her son may well have provided very well for her. We, we don't know. But poor people really were buried literally in a hole in the ground. The grave was dug. The stones were placed on the top to mark the grave for the purpose that people shouldn't go near that grave. Because if you went near the grave and you touched it, to the, during to the Jewish tradition is that you would become richly defiled. And so they wouldn't go near graves. And they headed to whatever cemetery it was outside of town. Now to make this scene, to make this an even more interesting scene, the dead man, do you notice, was the only son of his mother. 
And the one thing a mother in Israel wanted was a son. If you didn't have a son, it was the end of the family line. And remember, heritage and history was very important to Jewish people. And the fact that this is an only son makes this even more a sad scene. And also, Jesus recognizes that this is not just an only son, but this woman is a widow. Do you see that? Look at verse 12. The only son of his mother and she was a widow. Now this is getting sadder moment by moment, isn't it? She's already lost her husband, and no doubt she's going to bury her son next to her husband. Not only is the future of her family gone, but the present is in jeopardy now because she's lost her protector, she's lost her support. This is very sad. And here is this dear widow walking in front of the funeral. She's lost her husband, now she's lost her son. No security, no support, no family future. Now, thankfully, she had sympathy. It tells us that in verse 12. And a large crowd from the town was with her. A sizable crowd from the city, from the town was with her. The flute players and the cymbal banger and the wailing women and the friends and the rest of the townspeople, they were there to try and help. But don't miss this. This is the saddest of all sad scenes in Jewish family life. And Luke wants us to understand that. Because thirdly, we see the divine compassion of Jesus. The divine compassion of Jesus is at work here. And you see something in Jesus that is true of God, don't you? Look at verse 13. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Now that's just amazing. The Greek verb here has to do with feeling something in your gut. You, you feel a, a, an emotion, it means. Um, you feel this emotion, it, it sort of churns your stomach. That's what it means. It makes your heart beat rapidly. It, it makes your heart stop sometimes if you feel something strongly enough. And that's how Jews described affection, feeling, compassion. And friends, this is God. One thing that is very clear is the distinction of the true and living God. He is a God of compassion, isn't he? And that against the background of all other so-called deities in the world history of religions, none of which is compassionate, loving, gracious, forgiving, kind, merciful, tender-hearted. You know, there aren't, uh, there aren't saviour gods in other religions, are there? There aren't gods of love and tenderness and compassion. And this isn't even a spiritual issue here. This isn't even about redemption. This is just about plain sympathy with human sadness. This is like Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus because it breaks his heart to see what death does to a family. It's the nature of God to feel compassion. You know, Lamentations expresses that in that wonderful familiar passage often read at funerals. Lamentations 3, 22, 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is compassionate all the time. He's the God of all comfort. And so when you meet Jesus, you're going to see the same compassion. That is true of God. And here you see God in human flesh with compassion. It breaks his heart to see a widow in sadness. It breaks his heart to see hope lost. It breaks his heart to see love devastated. He cares about the family. He cares about human suffering. That's why he's a saviour. He even cares about those who never believe in him. He fills their lives with joy. I mean, why do you think the world is multicoloured? Why do you think food has so many varieties? Why is always the best food always calorific? But why, why do you think there is so many varieties? Why do you think there's so much rich and wonderful good things in life? Because God wants you to enjoy life. He cares about your happiness. He cares compassionately about your sorrow. And obviously in the end, he wants you to come to the knowledge of him in salvation so that you can enjoy those blessings forever. But in the, every manifestation of God in the Bible, you see that he is tender-hearted tender towards people. 
Remember? God so loved the world. And then this compassion then moves Jesus. Because look at verse 14. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. Now, he did something that, in a sense, he didn't want to do. He touched the dead. And if you did that, you were ritually defiled due, due to the, the way the Jewish tradition said. But Jesus just stepped up and touched it. And, and by the way, nothing defiled him. He wasn't subject to any defilement, real or ritual. And you know, stopping a funeral procession could be a serious thing. Can you imagine walking up to a woman, leading a funeral procession, weeping and saying, stop crying? That is either the act of a heartless person, that is a sick joke, that is the act of a fool, or it is the words of someone who can change the reason for the sorrow. You know, if, if they had people who were kind of watching out for this lady and somebody came up and said, look, stop crying, they might grab him and say, look, get out of here. This is a time for weeping. We hire people to do this. What are you doing? And then stop this funeral procession? I mean, it says, verse 14, and those carrying it, the coffin, stood still. The coffin bearers came to a halt. They just stopped. Question, what was it about Jesus' person that just stopped everything? I mean, you just didn't do this. This is outrageous behavior, isn't it? Tell a woman not to cry, touch a coffin, stop a funeral procession. You just don't do that. But this is Jesus, who is holy God. And he carries about him a holy authority. Notice he didn't even say stop, did he? He just put his hand on them and said, woman, stop crying. And he stopped the procession. What was it about his presence, his authority? It's because this is God. And God has holy authority. And then we lead on fourthly to the divine power of Jesus. And this is what we've been waiting for, isn't it? The divine power of Jesus. The middle of verse 14. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. Now, that would be the words of a fool or a sick joke if he wasn't God, isn't it? He didn't have to do anything. He just spoke. After all, Psalm 33, verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He, he created the entire universe with his speech. And so here's the creator, and the creator who created the entire universe with his word now opens his mouth and he says, Young man, I say to you, get up. Creative power explodes out of the mouth of the creator. I mean, imagine, he says, young man, and he's addressing a dead person. But he is God. He created the universe. He can create life in one that creates life in all. Young man, I say to you, arise, get up. And with that split second that he said that, life surged into that corpse. This is created power. This is God. And by the way, let me throw in another little verse here. John 5, 25, 29. This is important in relation to this. This is really encouraging. Let me even add more flavor to this to encourage us. Look at this. John 5, 25 to 29, it says. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. So, God the Father has the ability to give life. God the Son has been given responsibility to give life. Someday, in the final end of the age, he will give life to the whole world. Every person who has ever lived and died in this world, he will resurrect. 
some to the resurrection of life in heaven, some to the resurrection of damnation in hell. He has the power to do that, raise every single person who has ever lived from the dead. And this is a very simple task. This is just one young man, isn't it? Then it will be millions upon billions. And he will do it the same way. Arise. And out they will come from the sea and from the land and from the graves, the Bible says, they will come. And they will come to the resurrection of life into heavenly glory or they will come to the resurrection of damnation of eternal hell. The point is this, Jesus has been given the power to raise all the dead of all the ages, which he will do in the future. So a pretty simple task for him to raise this young man, isn't it? And also, would you notice, nobody asks him to do this. Nobody asks for any of this. There weren't any requests, was there? In fact, nobody seems to have any faith here. Did you notice that? Very important point here. Please hear this. Faith never is to be considered necessary for divine power to work. Please understand that. This is the lie of many faith healers who say that your faith wasn't good enough for God to work. Rubbish. That is a lie that faith healers say, and that's the reason why people don't get healed, they say, is because they didn't have enough faith. You know, I've spoken to Christians over the years whose lives have been wrecked by believing that lie. Listen, God is not, not impotent and your faith omnipotent. Jesus heals here, no request, and no faith is noted. It is never faith itself that activates divine power. What activates divine power is God. He doesn't need your faith to do what he wants to do. Now, sometimes Jesus used faith. Sometimes there was faith in his healings, but it wasn't necessary. Most of the healings, no faith is indicated, interestingly. Look, this is a sovereign act, and it is not done just out of a desire to display in power. It is really motivated by his compassion, isn't it? And what a wonderful insight that is into the heart of God. How deeply he cares about people suffering. And so verse 15, the dead man sat up and began to talk. Well, that will break up a funeral pretty quickly, won't it? I mean, can you imagine? And do you know what? Interestingly, Jesus did that, did that at every funeral he attended in the Bible. You have a look. There are several funerals in the gospel. Everyone he went to, he broke up by raising the dead. A bit annoying if you're a funeral undertaker, isn't it, really? But, you know. And interestingly, his miracles are always instantaneous, complete, and without rehabilitation or process. There was no sort of post-resurrection therapy, was there, needed here. He didn't have to learn how to talk all over again. Notice he sat up, this young man, and he began to speak. He was a mature man, fully alive, fully capable of mature speech and mature action. I mean, you can't imagine, can you, this, this massive crowd of people in this funeral, and it's just this guy sits up and starts talking. And then the end of verse 15, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. That was the point. You know, he could have said, now, I want you to travel with me and give, you, give your testimony. I want you to go on Christian TV. Didn't do any of that. He doesn't say that. He says, look, your mother needs you. That's why he did it. And I think after this, both the mother and the son probably wanted Jesus to stay around and they wanted to find out everything they could about him. And I'm sure Jesus gave them the message of the good news of the gospel. But the initial deal here was that this was a broken-hearted mother, and Jesus says, you need your son back, here he is. Can you imagine that reunion? Can you imagine a boy coming back from being gone, and now a mother welcomes him back? But can you imagine him coming back from the dead? What kind of celebration they had? Fire those wailing women, women. we don't need them anymore. You know, we don't need all of that. This is a party of all parties. Isn't it wonderful 
that the creator God of the universe cared about a family. He cared about a mum and he cared about a son. He truly is the God of all comfort. Well, that takes us to the response, because look at verse 16. They were all filled with awe and praised God. Why did they react like this? Because they knew they were in the presence of God. They knew God was there. They knew this was the power of God. There is no other explanation. And so they do the right thing. They begin to praise God. They said, hey, look, we better worship fast. We could get snuffed out here. You know, this, this guy's alive, and we could all be dead if we don't do some worshiping pretty quick. There could be a lot of funerals around here really quickly. They began to glorify God. And here was their conclusion. End of verse 16. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. And that literally means in the Greek, God has arrived here. God has come to help us. God has come to show his care for us. And you know, the people prayed for that. They prayed, God, visit your people. God, come down and help us. Come down and show your concern for us. And the Jewish people, Israel, had been praying for that for a long time. Remember, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel for over 400 years. There weren't any angelic visitations. There hadn't been any divine intervention. There hadn't been any miracles. There hadn't been any words from heaven. God had been silent for centuries. And there was this longing for God to visit his people. They were eager for God to come down into their world and fix their world. And we understand that, don't we, even today? Would we not love God to come down and bring righteousness and establish his kingdom, help us, his people? We understand. Well, they knew God was in their midst, and they realized God had visited them because there was no explanation for the dead coming to life. Nobody can do that. Verse 15, uh, verse 17 This news, the news that God was visiting them, that the man had been raised from the dead through the power of Jesus, this news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. And the message just went everywhere. God is visiting his people. And we know it's God because the dead live. And you can add to that the blind are seeing, the lame walking, the deaf hearing, the demons being uh, being cast out. God is visiting his people. But you know, it's a sad reality how fickle and fleeting that attitude was and how they underestimated it. They were right, God was visiting, but they didn't really understand that God himself was actually there in Christ. In Luke 19, 41 to 44, Jesus saw Jerusalem and he wept. You know that famous verse? He cried, he was crying because a funeral was coming. Let me read it to you. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And that's the destruction of Jerusalem in the Roman attack in 70 AD. He says, you're going to be judged. And the reason you're going to be judged, end of verse 44, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. They kept saying, God has visited us, God has visited us. But they didn't really understand it. And the consequence of that rejection is given in Acts 15, verse 14. God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. When Israel didn't understand, didn't recognize, didn't know that he had visited in Christ, when they didn't respond to that visit, God turned from Israel to the Gentiles. And in a sense, he visited them and took out a people for his name. And that's the church. And look again at verse 16 as I close. The middle of verse 16, and the statement that we skipped. Here's what they said. A great prophet has appeared among us. Was Jesus a great prophet? Yes. In fact, many other religions would say that. That's what the Muslims say. That's what the Mormons say. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses say. That's what almost everybody would say. Hey, Jesus, he was a great preacher, a great prophet. He was a great prophet who has appeared among us. No. He is the Son of God who came down from above us. 
And you know, it's understanding that that is, or it's misunderstanding that that is so deadly. They knew God had visited, but they didn't understand that Jesus was God, so they missed the time of their visitation, and therefore they were judged by God. A great prophet, you see, is an incomplete confession. You say, well, why did they conclude that then? Well, I'll tell you why they concluded it. It's because they knew of two Old Testament prophets, one named Elijah and the other one named Elisha. And both of those prophets, who were believed to be among the greatest of prophets in Israel, remember, both of them raised people from the dead. Do you know the stories? So, Elijah, 1 Kings 17, look it up. Elijah was used by God to raise, remember, the widow's son from the dead. And then came Elisha after Elijah, and you can read about that in 2 Kings 4, he had a similar experience in which God used him to raise someone from the dead. So, when they thought about who raised the dead, it was Elijah and it was Elisha, they were prophets, and so in their short-sightedness, they said, oh, right, so this Jesus, he is one like Elijah. Oh, he's like the one Elisha. This is a prophet, a great prophet, and we've had prophets with that kind of power before. Well, let me tell you something. If they knew their story, if they knew their history, they would know Elijah didn't raise the dead. He prayed, and God answered his prayer. And Elisha, he didn't raise the dead. God did that in answer to his prayer. But here, Jesus raises the dead. And he prays to no one, does he? Because he himself raises the dead man. That's the difference. So here's the right conclusion about the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 16, 13 to 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Friends, that's the right conclusion. To say a prophet has appeared among us is wrong. To say Christ, the Son of God, has come into the world is right. He is God. That is the gospel. Eternal life and resurrection for those who believe in the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the one who came from heaven to earth to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. That is the only, only acceptable view of Jesus because there is salvation in no other name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage. Father, we thank you for this wonderful display of Christ's power to be able to raise a dead man from the dead. Thank you that we see the divine purpose of Jesus, that he was working out plans and purposes. He knew what was going to happen. He knew where he was going. We thank you for the divine providence of Jesus, that he was able to orchestrate all things to happen at the time he wanted it to happen. We thank you for the divine compassion of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that the heart of Christ is for those who are lost, for those who are in sorrow, that there is real compassion. No other religion speaks of that. And Father, we thank you for the divine power of Jesus, that he himself raises the dead. Father, we thank you that this, this one, the Lord Jesus Christ, is someone who we know personally if we have accepted him. And so, Father, we thank you for what it means to know him personally. May we never forget the divine power of Christ. That Jesus explains God. Jesus reveals God. And so when we look at Jesus, we see God.
thank you for what that means. May that greatly encourage us, we pray. And Lord, in a moment as we come around the Lord's table, we thank you again that we see all of these things being played out. The purpose of Christ, knowing what was going to happen, that the, the, the providence of Jesus, all planned. He wasn't a victim of unfortunate circumstances. His death was foreordained. The compassion of Christ, that he died to save us. And the power of Jesus giving up his life, knowing that three days later he would rise again. Lord, as we reflect on these things, may we come thankfully and in remembrance of the one who died to rescue us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing before we come around the Lord's table. We're going to sing about the Saviour who loved us and that God so...